بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونصلي ونصلي على رسول الكريم أما بعد um, welcome uh, everybody السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته we are uh, continuing this uh, series on the aqaid the fundamental beliefs of the muslim and we are going back to chapter 1 uh, where we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask the question where is Allah is Allah everywhere where is he and the reason um, I've delayed this chapter is because it's a very technical one and I think to go to understand you know some of these questions and answers one has to uh, be a little bit familiar with the methodology and the style of of this book and, and of Islam and how Islam answers these questions and this is a very technical uh, um, question and answer the reason being we have to be to be very uh, careful in our um, wording because what you find is what you find is some people they read other words which you haven't said and then they start accusing you and that's happened a few times actually when people have accused uh, when I've talked about this they've said oh you've said this and you've said that I said I haven't said that you've inferred it but uh, show me where I've said it and they can't so we have to be very accurate with this and um, and the reason being, uh, this is not a subject that uh, uh, even ulama are taught actually. If you ask the ulama who's taught you that, uh, rarely you'll find this. They've said this person's taught me or that person's, or I've read it in this book. The, this, is, this is not a subject which uh, we wanted to talk about actually. But the reason we're talking about it and the reason we have to answer it is because the non-Sunni, the Khawarij beliefs are that... Um, Allah is not everywhere and that's the only reason why I've addressed it and they give they don't give any evidence actually they just give uh, just uh, give um, slogans and excuses they even say you can't even ask this question and some unfortunately some Sunnis have become confused on this and some Sunnis also uh, they don't understand when we say something they infer a lot of of wrong th information and it'll become clear as i go go through it so we have to be very careful with the wording and we have to we have to be very careful with the concepts so the question is is allah everywhere and you think it's a simple question with a simple answer it is a very simple question it's a question we are allowed to ask and the answer is yes allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everywhere He's present throughout his dominion. Where his dominion is, it's, you know, creation is part of his dominion. We don't understand how he is everywhere. We don't understand it because he hasn't explained it to us. And he is free from any limitations. He is free from any, uh, any restrictions. Uh, he's free from a place. He's free from direction. He's free from any form. We don't say he has a body. He's not like creation. So if we say he's everywhere, i.e. he's in the heavens and the earth, we just don't understand how. And he's there without limit. And he's there whether creation exists or not. He's still everywhere. So the, the reason we are saying that, we, we just explain, or rather we state what the Qur'an states, and what the Prophet has stated, sallallahu We can't reject Qur'an even if we don't understand it. Like, for example, we say, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ أَلِفْ لَامْ مِيمِ Nobody has explained that properly. No Mufassir has explained this, saying this is the definitive meaning. But we accept it. We accept Alif, we accept Lam, we accept Mim. If we reject any of these letters, we reject Qur'an, actually. If you reject one letter of Qur'an, then you are no longer Muslim. So we accept, and even we accept, we don't know what it means. So that's not new in Islam. Uh, Allah is a creator. He is free from any weakness. Um, 
and human logic and reason can't understand him because he is a creator of human logic and human reason. So how can we understand? So we can only accept what he says. So let's uh, prove this from Quran. Because to say he is not everywhere goes against Quran and, go, and goes against his majesty because in effect we then, we, then be, we, we then limit him. And the devil's always there to try and confuse us even further by, by, by um, suggesting some things to us to make him seem like he's, he's part of creation or he has limitations like creation or to ask silly questions which I'm not going to go into but anyway. So Allah says, وَهُوَ اللَّهُ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَفِي الْأَرْضِ He is Allah in the heavens and in the earth. That's very clear actually. So if we say he's not in the heavens, not in the earth, i.e. he's not everywhere, it goes against, clearly against this verse. However, we don't know what this verse uh, is actually, actually means. Because we don't mean he is in the heavens and the earth literally. How, how can we say that? We don't understand. He is in the heavens and he is in the earth. How? We don't know. What he means by that, we don't know. But we can't reject it. So on this basis, we say he's everywhere. How? We don't know. What he means by fee, we don't know. So that's just one verse. Allah also says, um, Allah also says, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ فَأَيْنَمَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ to Allah belongs the east and the west, and wherever you turn, behold the face of Allah. This is in fact the verse we use when people say, which direction uh, do you pray in? If you don't know Qibla, it doesn't matter. If you don't know Qibla, you take the best guess. Why? Wherever you turn, behold is the face of Allah. Allah is not confined to any one direction. In a sense, Allah is in all directions. He's not confined to one direction like we are confined because he's not like his, he's not like his creation. So wherever you turn, you will find the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, Allah mentions face here, wajhullah. It's not a face like we understand. It's not a, a face with the, the weak physicalities of his creation. No, not at all. We can understand by his majesty and by his greatness and by his authority like this. What he literally, or, or rather what he means by this, we don't know. But we can't reject the fact he has chosen to use this word. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everywhere. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ مُحِيطًا Allah, this actually verse means Allah encompasses everything. Now again, we can't, we don't take this literally. Allah's majesty is everywhere, Allah's knowledge is everywhere, Allah's uh, power is everywhere. Um, in, in that sense, Allah encompasses everything. Allah sees everything, Allah knows everything. وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ He is with you wherever, wherever you are. So he's here. In fact, I had a long discussion with somebody, it was actually an hour uh, long because he was rejecting the fact Allah is everywhere and he and even though I showed him verse after verse and then I asked him then I asked him is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is is he with us and he said yes he is well then you can't reject Allah you can't say Allah is not everywhere then if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is here with us and we believe he is here with us how we don't know then he is with you wherever you go. وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ And then, لَيْسَ كِمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ Just to emphasize the fact, there is nothing like him. There is nothing like him. لَيْسَ كِمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ There is nothing like him. So, we can't imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because all our, all our imagination is dependent upon our experience and dependent upon examples we have in our head. So if Allah is unlike anything, then we can't imagine him. So we just accept exactly what he says and also accept uh, in many of these cases, we well in all of these cases, we don't know the true meanings and depths of meanings, etc. We know a little bit as he has explained to us. Human understanding and human analogy and human reasoning is completely lost. Uh, as some ulama have put it, the, ocean, the ships of logic 
uh, or rather the ships of reason sink into the oceans of logic when trying to comprehend his greatness. We can't comprehend. So um, we just accept what he says. If he, sa if he says he's, he's, he's in the heavens and the earth, we accept it. How? We don't know. Some people say it just means his knowledge, his majesty, his greatness like this. Yeah, that's fine. But you, we don't know exactly what it means. So we have to just accept he is with you wherever you go. We can't say he's not with us. We can't say he's not in the heavens and the earth. We can't say he doesn't encompass everything. You see? So we have to accept this uh, just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And if we go to the uh, hadith as well, we begin to uh, understand a little bit more. And this is in Sahih al-Bukhari. And the Prophet said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, or rather, uh, this is Hadith Qudsi. So, uh, the Prophet has said, Sallallahu Alaihi Taala, that the Prophet has quoted Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. أنا عند ظني عبدي بي وأنا معه إذا ذكرني. So the Prophet has said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah says, I am as my servant thinks I am, and I am with I am with him. Whenever he remembers me, wa ana ma'ahu ida dhakarani, and I am with him whenever he remembers me. So whenever we remember him, he's with us. We can't say he's not with us. This is Sahih al Bukhari. For in dhakarani fi nafsihi dhakartuhu fi nafsi, and if he remembers me within himself, I remember him within myself. Allah uses the word nafs. How nafs applies to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? We don't know. Definitely not how it applies to us, how it applies to creation, but this is the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen to use. So maybe the best way of translating, if a person remembers me within themselves, I remember him within myself. in ذَكَرَنِي فِي مَلَئِن ذَكَرْتُهُ فِي مَلَئِن خَيْرٍ مِّنْهُمْ And if he remembers me in a group of people, I remember him in a group that is better than them. And then, if he um, comes one span nearer to me, I go one cubit nearer to him. And if he comes one cubit nearer to me, I go a distance of two outstretched arms nearer to him. And if he comes to me walking, I go to him running. Now, of course, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying when he says running, he doesn't mean running like we understand it. He means getting close to he means uh, of getting very close to. So, whenever we do dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says, I remember him. I remember him in a group better than you, them. I get closer and closer to him, so close, that the dis a distance of outstretched arms close. Allah is using analogies that we understand, but we, don't, we know we can't apply them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is just saying, look how close I am to you, I'm very very close it, when you do dhikr of me and this is a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari and if we continue because some some people have said to me we can't uh, we can't ask the question where is Allah well actually the Prophet وسلم, he asked this question a slave girl, a black slave girl was brought to him and um, the uh, the man who bought her said, I, I want to free her, but I'll only free her if she's a Muslim. So please, can you help me? Uh, and the Prophet asked her, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asked her, Ain Allah, where is Allah? And she pointed to the heaven with her finger. So the, where is Allah? She pointed uh, with her finger uh, to the heavens. Then he asked, he asked her, um, فَمَنْ أَنَا Who am I? And she pointed to the Prophet وسلم, and then she pointed to the heaven meaning uh, you are the messenger of Allah and then the Prophet said وسلم, set her free فَإِنَّهَا مُؤْمِنَ because she is a believer so how did he check her belief? he asked where is Allah? now she's not pointing meaning physically he's in the heavens what she's saying is, what, what, what the Prophet is saying is, وسلم, you know, idol worshippers worship to the idols. So he's asking, whom do you worship? Where is, 
Where is the uh, uh, Allah when you worship him? Where does your dua go? Where does your worship go? And she pointed uh, upwards, which means to the heavens. So that's correct. She, she doesn't point to any idol. And then he asks, so who am I? And again, she pointed to him and pointed to the heavens. You have been sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, hence, uh, he said, she is a believer. فَإِنَّهَا مُؤْمِنَ She is a believer. This is Abu Dawood. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just present in his creation. He's, pre pre he's present in the heavens. And Muhaddithin has explained that this is the direction of the dua. Now, we don't find anywhere where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says he is not everywhere. We don't find that. If it was such an important and necessary belief, Allah would have said, I am not everywhere. I am not in the heavens. I am not in the earth. I'm not, you know, maybe even I'm not telling you where I am, you know. We don't know. Um, uh, we wouldn't know then, but we are told he is in the heavens and the earth how we don't know uh, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows we just accept as the words are uh, and with those conditions that uh, he exists without place he exists without direction he exists without form and he exists without limit and to say he's not everywhere actually goes against his, his majesty and limits his majesty actually so different people have different ways of explaining this, and unfortunately, some people they go they go a little bit they're, they're a little bit sensitive on this, and they, you know they've even declared you know, fatwas of kufr have been declared. Um, we're not saying Allah is in everything. We don't accept that. We are just saying we just accept what the Quran says, and we also accept we don't know what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala means. We can't explain it. We just say what he is saying. He is Allah in the heavens and in the earth. How else do you say that? If someone says you can't say that, well, Allah is saying it. He is Allah in the heavens and the earth. What he means by that, we don't know. It's like saying Alif Lam Mim. I'm saying Alif Lam Mim. I don't understand it. I'm saying it. I'm just saying it how it is. Alif Lam Mim. You can't, you can't put a, a fatwa of kufr against that. So it's a misunderstanding. Because the people say, if you say Allah is everywhere, then, then you're accused. Oh, you're putting Allah as part of his creation. No, we're not putting Allah as part of his creation. He's everywhere, we don't know how. Without being dependent upon his creation, without being a part of creation, as, as we understand in our, in our limited sense. And, and he exists without place, without direction, without form and without limit. So we are putting all these caveats... Uh, and then say, and we accept what the Quran says. And don't forget, uh, the, the, the Prophet has explained, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I, I, am, uh, I am with my slave whenever he remembers me. He is with you wherever you go. And these are just some of the verses actually. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in the cave with Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu he actually said, لا تحزن إن الله معنا Don't be worried. Allah is with us. لا تحزن إن الله Ma'ana, indeed Allah is with us. So he himself is saying Allah is here, Allah is with us. So we have to accept. And to say he's not with us, then we go against all these things. So um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he transcends far beyond creation, far beyond our understanding, but we have to use the words that Allah has given us to use. He's everywhere without direction, place or form, and is not confined. And as I said, there is no Quranic verse or no hadith that says he is not everywhere. And even there is a verse, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ We are closer to them than their jugular vein. So he's very close to us. And when people uh, say things like, oh, you know what, if you say he's everywhere, then he's in the impure places as well. And we say, look, this purity and impurity, Allah is creator of this, it doesn't affect him. He is far beyond and far above that. It affects us. It doesn't even affect the earth, actually. The earth is a pure place, despite the fact it has impurities everywhere. If a pig dies on the earth and the earth absorbs it, the plants which grow are halal, actually. 
the earth purifies. You see, so the, this purity and impurity, it is, uh, it is um, relevant to us, to His creation, not to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. You can't, you can't assign uh, n uh, niceties and uh, um, purities and impurities like you assign to us to assign to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Allah created the devil; he's still pure. Allah is still uh, completely pure and completely um, um, haq, completely correct, completely true, and free from any weaknesses. And uh, but this is his uh, decision to create the devil. This is his decision to create the pigs, and this is his decision to create, you know, alcohol and like this and like. These are his decisions. So he doesn't make him impure in any way. So to say to say things like that, these are the devil's arguments which we which we try, which we need to avoid. And in in life, there are th certain things you don't say, out of politeness, out of respect. There are certain things you don't when you speak to somebody. There are codes of of uh, uh, speaking, codes of etiquette. When you speak, so these codes have to be adopted, especially when you talk about Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to denigrate Him and to bring Him down to the level of creation is completely wrong and completely illogical. Actually, it goes against the majesty of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So, He's unlimited. Um, he's free from uh, space. He's free from uh, um, form. He's He has no limit. Um, and he is everywhere. Whether everywhere exists or not, he's everywhere. Even if the, the creation was destroyed, he'd still be everywhere. And that, that is the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is present throughout his dominion. And it, I suppose it comes down to language, what language you use. So maybe everywhere isn't the best term to use. Maybe just say what Quran says, he's Allah in the heavens and in the earth. Which actually is saying, he's saying he's everywhere. But the Sufi Ikram and the Ahli Sunnah Wal Jama'ah, especially the traditional ulama, this is this is indeed what they what they say. So if we go to the extra couple of pages, which I have produced on this, just to sort of understand some additional explanations and evidences, Ibn Abbas reported that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that there there were people who were pondering, who were thinking about Allah. And the Prophet said, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, wa la qudra." Ponder over the creation of Allah. Don't ponder over Allah because your minds can't grasp Him. You can't catch His power. You can't comprehend Him. And this is in Mishkat. And where the Quran says, for example, "Inna Rabbakum Allah, alladhi khalaq al-samawati wal ard في ستة أيام ثم استوى على الأرش. Indeed, your Lord is Allah who created the heavens and the earth in six days. Now, days in this context means periods of time. And then, and then ثم استوى على الأرش. You know, there's been huge discussions about استوى استوى على الأرش. The the linguistic meaning of استوى is established. Himself on the throne, but we have to understand. We don't know what the meaning is actually. Uh, some people say manifest, other people say authority, other people say power, whatever. But the linguistic meaning of istawa is established, not, and we can't understand that as we understand this word applied to creation. So we 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 say this is what it says, this is what the linguistic meaning means. However, we don't know what the true meaning is, what the true interpretation is. We just accept it. He's everywhere without limit, without being part of his creation, without form, without direction, and without place. But we accept this verse. And again, We are closer to him than his jugular vein. Now some of us say what Allah means by that is He knows everything. Hence, that's why He's putting it in this way. Yeah, we we can't we can't deny that's uh, that's we can't deny that's not true. Definitely, that's true. However, um, when it comes to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, we can also can't deny He said this. So we have to accept He is closer to us than our jugular veins. There is nothing closer, which means closer than our lives. Actually, He He's extremely close to us. 
And uh, as I said, when the uh, uh, when the Prophet sallallahu with Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala, when they hid in the cave on the way to Medina al Manawwara as part of the migration, the Prophet said to him sallallahu alayhi wa and this is in Quran, لا تحزن إن الله معنا Don't be worried, don't be afraid. Surely, indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us. So, there, there you go. And Allah quotes this in the Holy Quran. So when you hear of a hadith in Bukhari, hadith in Muslim, hadith in Ibn, Ibn Majah, hadith in Abu Dawud, this is hadith in Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is quoting Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, this is what was said, because I was there. I could hear, I can see, I can see everything, I hear everything, I know everything. There's also this famous hadith where Abu Huraira reports, radiallahu ta'ala, and the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when half of the night, or two-thirds of the night is over, Allah, the blessed and exalted, descends to the sky of the world. Yanzilullah tabaraka wa ta'ala ila sama'i dunya And when when we hear the phrase illa sama it dunya it is it is the lowest heaven that that's what we mean and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks is there any beggar for forgiveness so he may be forgiven is there any person who is making dua so i can answer it and allah keeps asking until uh, it is dawn this is in sahih muslim ibn majah al adab al mufrad abu dawud in many many places now we have to accept Yanzalullah tabarak wa ta'ala ila sama'i dunya Allah descends to the lowest heaven. Now this is not a descent how we understand creation. If we were to descend the stairs, that is not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about here. It is a completely different uh, mechanism, even if I can use that word. We don't, we don't know. So ulama mufassirun have said Allah's special mercy, Allah's special forgiveness, Allah's special kindness, that descends. Which, which we, is completely acceptable. But at the same time, I don't want to reject the words. Allah doesn't say that actually. Uh, he says that, Yanzilullah tabarak wa ta'ala ila sama'i dunya. Allah descends. So what that means, we know it doesn't mean as he, in terms of as, his, as we understand his creation. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because Allah is free from all these limitations. So it, it definitely doesn't mean how we would descend, not at all. So you can say special mercy, special uh, blessing, special forgiveness. That descends right down and, and is there for everybody to take. And also seeing Almighty Allah on the Day of Judgment. And there are very uh, famous verses of the Holy Quran. Wujuhu yawma idhin nadira. إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرًا On that day of resurrection, some faces will be radiant, will be shining. إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرًا To their Lord, they will be looking. Look at this. They will be looking towards their Lord. So we will be looking, the people with radiant faces, at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now how is that possible? And let's not try and twist this verse. Allah is very clear in what He says. So let's look at a hadith. And um, Hazrat Jarir radiallahu ta'ala, he came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or the Prophet came out to them sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And, and he said, Innakum satarawna rabbakum yawma al-qiyama kama tarawna hadha. Basically, uh, there was a full moon. And the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will see your Lord on the day of resurrection as you see this full moon. And you will have no difficulty in seeing him. So he's very, very clear. Just like we can see the full moon, not in, in that sort of sense, but just like we have no difficulty seeing the full moon, we will have no difficulty seeing Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. I mean, this is from Quran actually. We'll be looking towards our Lord. And the Prophet has confirmed, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will see your Lord. You will see Him. Innakum sataruna rabbakum yawm al-qiyamah. You will see your Lord on the day of judgment. 
as easy as you see this full moon. You'll have no difficulty in seeing him. And where is this Sahih al-Bukhari? Sahih al-Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah. It's in many, many places. And the other ahadith say that even though uh, when you see him, you will not be harmed in any way. There won't be, you won't have crowds around you and you won't have any doubt you're seeing him. Let's turn to seeing Almighty Allah in Jannah. And, and again, we have to understand that while we're seeing him, he still has no limitations. He still has no direction. He still has no form. You see, so can, can you see now how we have to be very careful here? At the same time, there's a contradiction in, in the way we use the words because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unique. And we, we, can't, we can't understand him as confined or like, like creation in any way. So seeing Almighty Allah in paradise, very interesting. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the people of Jannah will be enjoying their blessings. Then the light will shine upon them and they will raise their heads. They will see their Lord looking upon them from above. Look at that. He will say, he will say, فَقَالَ Assalamu alaykum ya ahl al-jannah Qala wa thalika qawlu Allah salamun qawlam min rabbir rahim Look at that. He will say, peace be upon you, O people of Jannah. This is what Allah says in the verse, Salamun qawlam min rabbir, min rabbir rahim. There's a verse in Surah Yasin where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Salamun qawlam min rabbir rahim. Peace, uh, or salam, is a word from uh, the Lord Most Merciful. Qala fayanzuru ilayhim wa yanzuruna ilayh. The the most merciful will look at them and they will look at him. Look at that. He will look at them and they will look at him and they will not pay any attention to the delights of Jannah so long as they keep looking at him. And in fact, what you will find, you'll find in other hadith that if you read, they will feel a, a coolness in their souls, in their bodies. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala screens himself from them. His light, his blessings will remain uh, uh, in in their bodies. They'll, they'll feel the after effects. Nuruhu wa barakatuhu alayhim fi diyarihim. It will remain within them. Allah's light and Allah's blessing will remain in them. So the Jannatis will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and will be totally hypnotized by the fact he's speaking to them by his beautiful voice and also by the fact people will see his amazing light and they will feel it freshen and this is in Jannah in Jannah you have everything you have uh, everything you need p things you can't even imagine but as part of being in Jannah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reveal himself in a particular way we don't know how we will look up and we will see his his beautiful nur, we'll see his beautiful majesty, and we'll hear his beautiful voice, and he will speak to us, and uh, we will uh, the bodies will become refreshed. Look at this. We will certainly see him, but we don't know how. And um, finally, uh, there is a discussion where. Uh, there is a verse actually which says la tudrikuhu al-absar wa huwa yudriku al-absar there is a verse which says uh, no vision can grasp him but he grasps all vision and there is a discussion on this where there are some people say you see you can't see allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but ibn abbas radiyallahu ta'ala and said no he said listen he said qala ra'a uh, muhammadun rabbahu uh, the Prophet saw his Lord Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because when he said this verse La tad, la tadrikuhu al-absar wa huwa yudriku al-absar no vision can grasp him but he grasps all vision the, Ibn Abbas said radiyallahu ta'ala this is what Allah means by this when he manifests his light when he, when he allows his full or, or part of the power of his light without restriction when he does that, then no, nothing can survive the, his power, his majesty. So this is what Allah means by this. No, 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 you, no vision can grasp his true majesty. And he, he also then confirmed 
that Ra'a Muhammadun Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Rabbuhu Marradain The Prophet saw his Lord twice He saw him twice Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam This is in Dirmidhi Sharif And it's a Hassan Hadith So he actually confirmed Qala Wayhaka Thaka Iza Tajalla Binuri Alladhi Huwa Nuruhu وَقَدْ رَعَى مُحَمَّدْ رَبَّهُ مَرَّتَيْنِ So when Allah talks about no vision can grasp him, he's talking about when he manifests his most powerful nur. Yes, then nothing can survive, except actually except Rasulullah sallallahu So um, I hope that's, that's clear, and I hope also you begin to understand why this is a little bit technical and why we didn't do this right at the beginning. Because um, there is seemingly contradictions in language, we have to be very, very careful. As an example, I have a lecture actually on YouTube on this, and it's, it's received quite a few comments. And people have said, oh, you've said Allah you know, exists like his creation, and I haven't said that. We haven't said that anywhere. In this book, it does, it's, it's not there. Other people have said, you have said Allah is um, in everything. I haven't said that. In fact, we reject this. Another person has said, oh, you saying Allah is physically everywhere. No, I haven't said that. We haven't said physically everywhere. We've said he is everywhere. We don't know how. You see how people misinterpret. And the reason they misinterpret is, number one, they don't listen to what's being said. These are Allah's words, not mine. وَهُوَ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَفِي الْأَرْضِ He's Allah in the heavens and the earth. Allah's saying that. I'm not saying that. How would you translate it? I'm translating word for word. And we accept we don't understand. Like Alif Lam Mim, we translate word for word. Alif Lam Mim. We, we actually read the letters out. The letter Alif we read, the letter Lam we read, the letter Mim we read. Huruful, huruful muqatta'at. These are the uh, special letters Allah has revealed and He hasn't given us, He hasn't revealed the meanings to us. So similarly, when He talks about Himself, we just accept all the words He says. We know the linguistic meanings, and we are able to uh, read the tafsir of what the Mufassirun have said. They've been very careful and they've said uh, his knowledge is everywhere, his power is everywhere, his majesty is everywhere, his authority is everywhere. We accept all of that. But he, you know, he doesn't actually say that. But in order for the qawm, for the people to understand, that's how the Mufassirun have explained. And, and again, just finally, again, the reason I've put this in, in this book is because this is a big issue for the non-Sunnis, for the Khawarij. They, they are so sensitive on this that they've used such powerful uh, uh, phraseology even to the extent, and I've, I've still got these books I had to go out especially to a non-Sunni bookshop and buy them if you believe Allah is everywhere you should be killed even they've gone as far as saying that and that then, I worked with Hazasar Rahmatullah to produce a book on where is Allah and uh, so he's the one who's taught me and when we, when we produced this book which is quite funny actually the book title was following extremism in Quran and Sunnah because they, they were saying things like this Bida, Kufr, Haram, Shirk Allah is not everywhere you know like this so I went, I went through the verses or rather he went through the verses with me we produced a book and when I distributed it uh, this happened to be in, in, a, in a camp uh, a three four day camp when we distributed it all the non-Sunnis bought that book because obviously the title excited them. They all bought that book, and then they went quiet for for whole two days, completely quiet. And I phoned Hazrat Sahib Rahmatullah from the camp. I said, Hazrat Sahib, they, they, they've all been sold out, <laughs> and uh, uh, they're all quiet. And he said, okay, let's see what they have to say. He was so confident, let's see what they have to say. And then on the last day, they said, this is not just major kufr, this is major shirk. You know, there's no such thing as kufr and shirk. There's major, this major things being introduced. Major kufr, major shirk, major haram, major everything. Heaven's sake. And we're going to answer it, you know. And I, I said, where's the answer? No, no, we're going to answer it. It's going to be answered from Medina University. I said, you haven't got an answer for it. No, we're going to answer it from Medina University. <laughs> so, then I phoned Hazrat Sahib again, rahmatullahi and I said that they're going to answer it. He goes, fine, let them try, let them try and answer it. And if they answer it, we will answer their answer. Look at this. And he says, Quran's very clear. You can't. And they hadn't. They hadn't come across these verses because the book was on Bidda and, and the book was on where is Allah and like this. I've still got one copy, I think. Um, and uh, they still haven't answered it. 
There, there's no, there's no, uh, when people ask me and say Allah is not everywhere, I have one simple, show me one verse or one hadith Allah says, I am not everywhere, just show me. Because I've got a, a Quran verse that says I am. I am in the heavens and the earth. I am wherever you turn, I'm there. You know, I'm, I've got evidence after evidence. In, in Quran, in hadith, it's just we don't understand how. And if that's confusing you, I can't help you if you're not going to listen to what we have to say. If you're not going to listen to Quran, if you're not going to listen to a hadith. Uh, unfortunately, we have to talk about this because of what you've been saying. We've been forced to talk about this. No, not that we want to because it can be very confusing. But you forced us. So here are the verses. There's nothing we've invented. Uh, it's all there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me for any mistakes. May accept this humble effort, humble lecture. Amin wa khiru da'wana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Happy to try and answer any questions you may have. I, I, have, a, I have a question and a comment. One question that I'm, uh, I'm digressing, but it will help me to understand. When Hazrat Jibreel first came and said to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Iqra, what was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa response to that? Yeah, again, uh, I take everything from Quran and Sunnah, okay? So, if you... I've actually addressed this very question in Appendix 1, in the very first part, A1. I'll just, I'll just summarize it. I'm not going to go through it. You can read it, okay? Now, um, let's, let's make a couple of things clear. We can't use the word illiterate for our Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Illiterate has some very bad meanings and bad connotations. You, if you want to say he couldn't read and write, fine, you can say that, but don't use the word illiterate, okay? And if you mean ummi means illiterate, that's, that's not correct. When applied to our Prophet Muhammad wasallam, ummi means one who hasn't been taught by humans. And ummi can also mean uh, a people who have not had a book uh, revealed to them by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he's an Ummi prophet for an Ummi people, if you, if you see what I mean. He was sent to a people who hadn't received a book. The Arabs hadn't received a book. The Jews had received a book. But this is a prophet came from the Arab side, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that's the first thing. Don't translate Ummi as illiterate for our prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How can you say illiterate well, when illiterate means ignorant sometimes? When he's, he's guided uh, you your whole life to, from birth to death. How can you say illiterate? When he's been taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can you say illiterate? When he uh, um, can answer every question you put to him. Yes, of course this information comes from Allah. How can you say illiterate when he performed 1500 miracles? How can you say illiterate when he was able to, uh, to challenge anybody uh, who, who came to speak against him? How can you say illiterate, when he answered everybody's questions uh, about ilm e how can you say illiterate? He had huge amount of knowledge, uh, immense amount. He, 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 he knew the number of bones, uh, joints in the human body. How can you say illiterate? You see, when people came to him and said, I have an illness, he, he touched their blessed chest and told them what the illness was and told them what the cure was. How can you say illiterate? Which doctor can do that? Which physician can do that without any equipment? He, he had the power to do that. So don't say illiterate. He was, he was the most literate. He was the most knowledgeable human being. He's the most uh, 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 a, a human being with the most abilities. And he understood uh, everything he needed to understand and to explain to us. He, he, he predicted the future. How can you say illiterate? He predicted the mobile phone. How can you say illiterate? He predicted that the people of the desert will be competing with each other by building tall buildings. You make a prediction. You, you make a prediction now for a thousand years' time and, and see if anybody listens to you. you. You are the ones who are illiterate. I'm not talking about anybody here. You are the ones who are illiterate. You don't even understand the word ummi. You don't even understand the word literate. So that's number one. Don't, let's not use that word illiterate. If you say he can't read and write, fine, okay, you're entitled to your opinion because he didn't read and write. I mean, I have to, we have to admit that he didn't 
go around writing stuff and reading stuff. He, and, and the reason he didn't, he didn't need to. Okay? He didn't show. But could he read? Could he write? And what did he say when Jibreel alayhi salam revealed Iqra? <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, this, this, uh, this hadith, um, when Jibreel alayhi salam came and said Iqra, the Prophet's answer was, Sallallahu alayhi wa ana biqari. I, I can't read. All right, let's say it means that. I can't read. Okay? I'm not, let's not dispute that for the time being. I can't read. Okay? In now, let me explain how language works and how English works and Arabic works. Okay? Imagine you're fasting and I give you some food because I'm eating something. I give you some food. What do you say? You say, I can't eat. I'm sorry, I can't eat. Are you saying you're incapable of eating? Or are you refusing to eat? There's a difference. When the Prophet said, Sallallahu I can't read, he's not saying, I am not able to read. He's saying, I am refusing to read. I'm not going to read. Like, have, have this food. No, I can't eat it. Why? Because I'm fasting. I can't read this. Why? Because you haven't begun in the name of Allah. So, if it meant, I can't read, why is Jibreel al -Islam asking him for the, in, the, in the first instance? Why is he asking him? Read. Why is, what, what, what use is this conversation if Jibreel al -Islam knows he can't read? Why is he saying read? That, that makes complete, that doesn't make any sense at all. When the Prophet said, said I can't read, Jibreel is Jibreel is deaf? Why is he asking again then? Why is he saying again, read? And the, why doesn't the Prophet say, didn't you hear me the first time? I can't read, I'm incapable of reading. No, he's not saying that. He says, I refuse to read. I'm not going to read. Then Jibreel says, Iqra, no, I'm not going to read. Iqra, no, I'm still not going to read. And then Jibreel alayhi salam, Iqra, Bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord. We start Quran with the name of Allah. It's a lesson for us. He's teaching us, the Prophet sallallahu do not read Quran until you start with Allah's name. Iqra, Bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. So where he's saying, Ma ana biqari, I can't read. You have to understand in the same construct as when someone uh, uh, says to you, eat while you're fasting, I can't eat. I can't eat this. No, you can eat it. You're refusing to eat it. And he can read. He's refusing to read. Now, let's see, if, is there evidence where he said, I can read or I can write? Okay. Well, let's have a look. Um, and if you read the appendix, you'll find it there. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, once the, um, the Prophet was ill, peace be upon him. This was, I think these, this was in his final days. And um, his illness was becoming worse. And, he, and this is what he actually said. He actually said to his companions, um, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Aktub lakum kitaban la tadillu ba'dahu. He said, I will write... Aktub, I will write something for you after which you won't be misguided. In other words, bring me bring me the instruments for writing, okay? And then Aktub, I will write for you, Lakum, a statement after which you will not go astray. He didn't say call the scribe. He said, I will write for you. If you look at the grammar, I, this is in Sahih al-Bukhari and it's in two places. And then uh, what happened was the companions started to argue. They're very upset. They started to argue amongst themselves. And then the Prophet Sallallahu he, he wasn't happy with that. And so then he, he stopped. He stopped right. He didn't want to write it after that. He said, I'm not going to write it. He was prevented because of the, the discussion that happened. And Ibn Abbas 
was very upset. He goes, I wish we hadn't had that discussion, the argument, because the Prophet was prevented, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, from writing. So even he confirmed he prevented from writing. So if you just read that, you will find he could read and write. And if you want to misunderstand Ummi, and misunderstand I can't read without the context. And by the way, this hadith uh, actually is a dream where he saw Jibreel alayhi salam, okay? And so it can't mean, uh, Prophet is not saying, I don't know, I'm incapable of reading. If, that's, if that was true, why is Jibreel asking him in the first place? Why this pointless, pointless discussion? You know, it's like you're going to somebody, speak French, I can't speak French. I'm telling you, speak French. Oh, I can't speak French. I'm telling you for the third time, speak French. No, I, I still can't speak French. The first time you ask me, how oh, well, you keep asking me? Then uh, you listen to what I'm saying. Should I say it, in, uh, should I say it again? Can you hear <laughs> what I'm saying? So it's a completely logical di uh, conversation if he really can't read. If he's saying, I can't read, meaning I refuse to read until you start in the name of Allah. And then Jibreel Islam then said, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who created. So I hope that answers it. Now, the people who say, um, you see, look, Islam can't be understood by everybody. All right? Uh, Allah gives a list of people who can understand it at the beginning of the Quran in Surah Baqarah. ذلك الكتاب لا ريب في they must have taqwa. And part of taqwa means sincerity. They must have taqwa. And then, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ They believe in the unseen. And a few other, and if you follow the list, <coughs> you'll find this is the, these are the conditions if you want to understand Islam. Okay? Otherwise, if everybody, I mean, someone said to me, uh, if Quran was so great, why... Why don't non-Muslims convert immediately uh, as soon as they read it? I said because Quran is great, but like any book, you have to approach it with the correct mindset and the correct intentions. And the correct mindset is you want sincerely to be guided. If you don't want to be guided, and you're reading the Qur'an like a curiosity or an academic work, then that's what you're going to get. But if you want to be guided, everybody who's approached Qur'an from that perspective has been guided. And that's the greatness of the book. Similarly, if you have the wrong mindset and you want to understand Qur'an wrongly, yeah, you can do that. Nobody's going to stop you. But then don't make up your own meanings. And that's a problem with some of the translations. The translations of Qur'an have been done by linguists not scholars and linguists will mistranslate a word like they've mistranslated ummi even now you've seen mixed mixed translations illiterate unlettered some people have even even used the word ummi because they don't want to translate it you see so they've realized so that the translations of quran are going through this phase now we're getting some good ones Assalamu alaikum, it's um, Nadia here, Sheikh Saf. Wa alaikum, um, to, Just a, a question, please. You touched on it earlier um, when you discussed uh, around the, um, the Qibla position for the namaz. Um, a friend of mine actually asked this question. It was quite bizarre because we, we was out and um, she wanted to read the namaz and we were trying to figure out which way Qibla was. And I said, and I mean, I personally said to her, well, why don't you just... If you if you miss it a little, if it gets a little bit late, read Kazar when you get home, because we was in the car and I just thought it wasn't. I don't know in my in my in my head at the time. I just thought, well, we're gonna have to. How is she gonna read it in the car? Like you know, how, how can you? How is she gonna read it? So would in a situation where where you're not quite sure. I know you said lies everywhere. And I obviously we, you should know where Kibla is, preferably, or find out. And if you can't, then 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 yeah, read the Namaz, read, read your Salah. But um. If it's a case of you know you're going to get home in about 40 minutes because you're going to you're driving back and yeah you might have just missed the timing slightly and just read the kaza or or would you say well actually you should have parked up and and just read read the namaz yeah um look if you're traveling uh and you have the ability to read the namaz on time you should stop and read it you shouldn't you shouldn't arrive home late and uh, and then with the qaza, you should you should uh, try and avoid that. I know sometimes it's unavoidable. 
So do your best to read all the prayers on, on time. And, you know, you, usually you can manage. If you're in a car and th there's no other alternative, yeah, you can pray. You, I suppose you're going to have to pray in the car, isn't it? Just like we have to pray on a train or on an aeroplane or, you know, whatever. I remember once I was going to Holland with Hazrat Sa Rahmatullahi and we were on a ship. It was in a storm, okay? And I thought, you know what, this is a good reason for us to sit down and, and just pray. And Hazrat Sahib took his jhana and said, come on, let's go up on deck. There'll be nobody there. <laughs> so so we, we went up on deck and there was so much wind and there was bits of rain and the ship was rolling. And that was the most difficult namaz I've ever read because we had to, we, we, you know, we couldn't fall. We had to, so half our energy was spent just, just keeping our balance. Now, I suppose it, the thick rules would have allowed us to sit down. I just remember that the Jarnamas were flying about. Hazasar was standing like a complete, you know, rock with foundations. And I was, sometimes I thought I better grab onto him before I fly, fly off, you know. I even lost my topi actually, not on that occasion. The wind was so strong, it blew my, blew my topi off. But not on that occasion. But um, that was a good topi actually. But anyway, so we were, we were just, just balancing like this. And it was an Isha. And I thought, okay, we read our photos. Maybe he'll, he, he, he's not going to read his wit. No, he got up and he read his, he read his wit. There. Nothing's going to stop him. So he got up and then he read his wit. And I was read it as well. And we had to keep putting the jhana out and stuff. And do you know what? That was a beautiful spiritual experience, mashallah. He's not going to, he's not going to miss his namaz. He, I don't, he doesn't care about the storm. He doesn't care about, he's on top deck. We're praying our Isha, we're praying our Widda, absolutely. Uh, and I'm not one who, who you know, easily misses my, my namaz. I even prayed on a rock in, in, in the stream once. There's a nice rock. I thought that was a good place to read the namaz. So I went to that rock and I prayed. I prayed on the stream. I'm not going to put this in the final idea, but anyway. So Alhamdulillah, nothing can stop you praying. We're not, not in this country and we shouldn't, we should try and avoid our Ghazar prayers. You know, I put up a post today about um, uh, insurance, life insurance. And uh, if people ask, have you got life insurance? We say, yeah, yeah, we got life insurance. And they say, who, who is it with? Which company is it with? It's not with a company, it's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then they say, what do you mean? What's your premium? My premium is five times namaz. And my premium is lots of zikr. And my premium is lots of durud on the Prophet sallallahu That's my life insurance. And that's why we shouldn't miss these things. The, these things are, are more important than anything else. And they don't take up too much time. So there's no need to miss them. Even if I'm in a meeting, I'll say, oh, I'm sorry, I have to pray. If we had to go to the bathroom, we'd, we'd, sorry, I have to, I can't, I can't wait. I'm so desperate, I have to go to the bathroom. Nothing, nothing's going to stop you. And so I, 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 I'm, nothing's going to stop me reading the mahds. I'll, I'll manage. Worst case scenario, you can join your Zuhra and Asr together if you have to, Maghrib and Isha together if you have to. That's the worst, worst case scenario. In, in Hanafi fiqh, we try not to, but it's allowed in the, in the, in the other fiqhs. And, and, you know, in Juma I was late, because I read Juma, I was late coming back for lunch uh, in, in my office when I used to work in, in an office. And, and the line manager said, you, you come late every Friday. He goes, yeah, that's right, I do, but I make up the time. I come maybe at half an hour, sometimes an hour. So rather than an hour for lunch, I take one and a half or two hours, but I make it up. I'm not going out drinking, I said, like you lot do. <laughs> when you come back after a liquid lunch, that's what they called it. I, I don't do that. I'm praying. He goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, yeah, you should be sorry. Yeah, you should be sorry. I'm praying to Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al -kareem. ربنا إننا منا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وقنا عذاب النار ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم اغفر لي ولوالدي رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه ونور عرشه وزينة فرشه وقاسم رزقه ومزهر لطفه محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين. Okay, everybody, thank you very much for joining us, and we'll carry on next week, inshallah. Inshallah, we'll see you next week. Inshallah, you take care. Okay, okay, salamu.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.